All right, everyone, welcome to Elijah Lockhart's thesis defense. This is a very fortuitous occasion. We're all very excited to have him here and be reading his beautiful thesis called Some Boys Name Themselves. Um, Eli has done such incredible work on this. Uh, he kind of just like last semester, you're just like, hello, I'm going to go write like 61 poems. Goodbye. <laughs> and, then, like, and then you wrote 61 poems and like, and they're gorgeous poems. Um, I'm so excited to talk about them with you and with the other members of the committee. Um, so Eli, what I'm going to have you do first before we even dive into the conversation is give us a little bit of context. So talk about, um, your intent behind the poems, your influences writing these poems, mm -hmm. what you hope to accomplish with the collection, and then we'll dive into questions. All right, so my thesis is clearly autobiographical. Um, there's not every single poem in it, but most of the poems in it are either directly pulling from my life or the lives of the people around me. Most of it deals directly with like my adolescence, moving into adulthood and being a trans queer person, you know, living the sort of life that I have, also being biracial and those sorts of experiences. Um, and then as I was continuing to write my thesis, elements of grief sort of became a recurring mm -hmm. theme, either like the death of the self as like those transitions happened in childhood, or like the loss of friendships, or as I became older, losing people in my life. And so that became a theme that was also sort of pulled into the work. So I was exploring sort of how my transition as an end and a beginning of things also melded into other aspects of my life. So I was inspired by, you know, a lot of people that I've been reading for many years, um, like all of my teachers, all of my, you know, teachers of craft and the poets that I've had around me, um, both in my undergrad and in graduate school. Um, people like Philip Levine as well, who I've been reading since I was pretty young. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then, you know, as I was getting into graduate school, there were other names that kept coming back up, like Ada Limone. Um, I read a lot of Nathaniel Mackey, uh, which was somebody that I found in graduate school and was very, you know, inspired by the sense of rhythm and language and those sorts of elements that I feel like I'm not as intrinsically good at. So it's good to look at a lot of that work and try to bring that in. There were people like uh, Morgan Parker mm -hmm. and Cameron Awkward Rich mm -hmm. that I was reading a lot of as I tried to like break out of the forms that I've been using and you know explore those other types of writing and using the page, those sorts of things. Uh, I read a lot of Kaveh Akbar. I read Natalie Diaz. So there were like a lot of those sorts of writers that uh, developed the way that I used the page and used my language and those sorts of things was how I was looking at a lot of those books that I was reading. And then towards the end of my second year, I started reading a lot of books that were just focused on grief mm -hmm. because I really didn't know how to like express that on the page and bring that into my writing as much. I had a problem, especially my first year, where I was hiding the narrative and I didn't want to actually express it. And I was trying to figure out how do I express these things without just putting all of my grief on the page? Like right. How do I you know, reserve some parts while still making the story clear and those sorts of things? So I read a lot of just like pure grief poetry. Uh, I read Gabriel by Edward Hirsch, mm -hmm. which is just one long poem mm -hmm. of grief about his son's death. Mm -hmm. uh, I read Brother Bullet by Cassandra Lopez, um, uh, A Fine Yellow Dust by Laura A. Paul. And the thing that all these books had in common was they were about like deaths too soon, mm -hmm. which is what was sort of resonating with me a lot at that time. Um, either like metaphorical deaths or the actual ones that I was experiencing. Um, so I was, I was sort of bringing in those pieces. Two other books that really helped me were uh, Revising the Storm by Jeffrey Davis and The Anchorage by Mark Wunderlich. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that book at first and then I read it probably four more times. <laughs> so there was like a lot of these things where I like changed how I felt about the work I was reading or found different things to like in them than what I initially found, and I think that that was what um, sort of changed the way I was looking at my own poetry. A lot of the poems that I had written and tried to revise maybe in my second year or even last semester, the revisions turned out worse. And then like this last semester, I was just churning out revisions that I was like, oh, I'm actually doing something now. So I had like a bit of a breakthrough, and I don't know what it was, but I just, last semester especially, I just kept reading. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's you know, books that I read that probably helped me in small ways that I don't even know or like can't even list them all, but um, 
those were the main ones that I was thinking about. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so if you don't have anything else you'd like to tell us contextually about this, I'm ready to dive in. Yes. Are you all ready? Do Most you definitely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, Eli, this is a very impressive collection. Um, I had seen all of these just sort of like moments before um, I, I read the entire thing. I saw a draft of this, and then I saw the final draft. Um, and I'm wondering, right, so like you and I share some background here um, in terms of transness and queerness, and I found myself as I was reading, I was really struck by the figure of your father mm -hmm. and how familiar that figure feels, not to bring myself into it too much, but like it felt familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was kind of like, whoa, you know, the father figure here is like quite the presence. And he's, he had cancer, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he also had this sort of, this kind of a resistance to your transition. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, there's some resistance in a lot of capacities, but yeah. a lot of my resistance that I felt from my mother was very direct. Okay. But a lot of the resistance that I felt from my father was sort of like, he would just not talk about it a, right. little, a bit more, right? Right. Um, and part of that was like fear of including him in the conversation, yes. right? Yes. Like, if I push too far, what's going to happen? Yes. So it was sort of a lot of just like, kind of like quiet feelings. Quiet, yeah. like resistance. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm remembering just... Uh, thinking of what you said just now, the poem where you're looking at your mother, mm -hmm. the like we talked about this too. Where you go down the stairs and you see your mother in the kitchen, and right. she's like sort of upset about your transition. And I was wondering, formally speaking, um, syntactically speaking, just like it, you know, in terms of how the poems are laid out on the page, how do you see your parents' reactions to your transition translating into your poetry? Yeah, what sort of Sorry, so sort of like craft decisions did you make? Yeah. Right. I think that I I present my father as a very different character than my mother. Even like in the poems where my mom appears, she is usually not like represented as as large of a character. Either she's like represented as something else, like in that poem where uh, I bring in you know Victor Frankenstein and that sort of thing, right. or she is sort of a character in the story that is influencing it but not like as directly acting on it mm -hmm. um, and so that was like the form that I chose I think like there were maybe some more things that I wanted to explore with that but what I got to was a little bit more of like the ways that her um, sort of reactions would influence how I felt about my transition and so it was a little bit more indirect I didn't like um, feels you know as strongly about including like some of the more you know conversations that we had or things like that because it was a lot of just like slow development mm -hmm. which is what I felt a lot more from my mother right that it was like a thing that was very slow and gradual and that was kind of how I tried to represent her in my transition mm -hmm. meanwhile with my father I had probably a few pivotal moments yeah. right like there was my initial attempt to, <laughs> to come out uh, there was you know the conversation where he said that he would let me start on hormones. There right. was, you know, the first time that he called me his son in public or, um, you know, him giving me my shot. Aside from that, there weren't like a lot of big moments. It was just sort of like, he was there, <laughs> he was <laughs> present and just not really saying much. And mm -hmm. so I, I sort of tried to represent him as either like this bigger sort of lurking <laughs> figure in my poetry <laughs> a bit or as like, somebody in a moment right like less yes. of a less of a, a presence more just like he's a character he's right here um yeah. either he's there or he's not which was like he was like in a scene very much or he was not present in the scene because i felt like his his character in the um, thesis sort of is such a big presence that when he's there he like takes up the mm. scene very much so when i had my dad showed up in a poem, it usually resolved, revolved around him. Mm -hmm. When my mom showed up in a poem, which she probably did more mm -hmm. overall, um, she could be just sort of present in the scene without it becoming a poem about my mom. Right. So I think I approached it two different ways in like that sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking, uh, and I'll, I want to come back to this later, but I'm thinking of the top surgery poem mm -hmm. as it relates to your dad. And your dad is kind of, he's there. 
Mm-hmm. You know, he is there at this pivotal moment of your life, and he's like existing, and he's having his feelings. You know what I mean? But the way that this that you, the speaker of the poem, incorporate him into the poem, you fold him in with compassion. You know what I mean? And you fold him in with kind of like an awareness of the largeness of his role in your life. You know right. what I mean? Um, and so I thought that was just so lovely. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> kick it over to my colleagues here. One of the things that's really fascinating about this collection is, and in your intro you talked about autobiographical poetry, but you also have this strand about memory and you use the word mismemory. So I wanted you to talk about how free are you in reconstructing your own childhood and transition? How free are you in terms of that that concept of mismemory, of remembering it the way you need to remember it. Yeah, I think that was something that I especially struggled with early because I had these feelings of like, well, this is the way that I remember things, not necessarily the way that other people remember things, and how much can I represent mm-hmm. my story while infringing on other people's. I have one poem in the collection that is from my sister's perspective, um, which is something that I felt mixed about, mm-hmm. very mixed about, which she has read, because uh, I did show it to her beforehand to be like, this is cool. Uh, and one of the things she said to me was like, it's not how I remember things, but like you can include it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's still your work kind of thing, um, which I think is a big part of it. I wanted it very much to feel like this is how I remember things, which is why I... I had, um, I don't know if any of them, I don't think any of them made it, but I had a lot of dream poems that I was writing for a period of time. And I think part of that and also the mismemory was that I wanted to very much make it feel like this is how I remember things. This is not necessarily the truth, but Mm -hmm. this is my, you know, the way that I experienced a lot of these events um, to sort of represent and to me, a little bit, it was sort of like uh, clearing my name <laughs> Yes. <laughs> in a weird sense. Um, I was sort of terrible to be around for a lot of my childhood. <laughs> it's, and I know that everybody is to some extent, yeah. but especially in middle school and like early high school, before I really started my transition in full, I was, I was pretty miserable to be around because I was miserable all the time. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, a lot of that has still kind of hung over my head a little bit. Uh, And so part of writing this, part of like the catharsis in writing this was being like, this is how I experience things, you know, and it doesn't make the way that other people experience them right or wrong. It Mm -hmm. just is the way that I feel about a lot of these things. Like, you know, I know for, or to some degree, the fact that I don't like own my blackness as much as some people, people might would want, want. Yes, um, is a that factor. was going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> like that is something that has come up before in my life, and you know, part of that was, and, and that's I didn't touch on that as much as maybe I was intending mm-hmm. to originally mm-hmm. in this, but part of that came into this of like this is my experience of my race, whether or not it is a black experience or not, right? So, I don't know, that's why I kind of use some of those phrases of mismemory, because it sort of changes time, it changes place, it's looking to the future, it's looking to the past and what I remember of it, and maybe shifting it, or looking at it in a dreamlike way, for me to represent like the feelings that I had at that time, mm-hmm. rather than what actually happened, yeah. mm-hmm. because that was more important to me. Because I would argue, reading this, that the way blackness is portrayed is few through those funeral poems so can you talk about how those poems because I I understand what you're saying but I when I read those poems I am driven back to and maybe this has less to do with race and more to do with family and it's all a big confusing mess but when I read your funeral poems I am driven back to the family funerals that I have been forced to attend. <laughs> you know, there's always this you know, prescription, you will come and you will mourn this person who you did not like. <laughs> so can you talk about, the, and, and you know, you also talked in your beginning statement about grief and grieving, which is a subject that 
I'm familiar with too, uh, unfortunately. So can you talk about how those funeral poems function in terms of speaking to race, speaking to your transness, speaking to uh, family? Yeah, I, I think that to some degree, my, well, those poems in particular, or a lot of my poems that deal with some of my more extended family, mm -hmm. um, represent to some degree me feeling other because I think in those situations where everybody's brought together and they're expected to feel like we're grieving together, we're all in this together, we're sort of you know brought together as a family, those things that make you feel other can become even more pronounced a little bit in that way where you're like, I don't know if I like am really here. I don't know if I'm really you know part of this grieving group, right? Like feeling sort of distant in that way as like a byproduct of the grief in some ways mm -hmm. and um, I think that's why some of that came out you know my um, like to some degree with some of my family it was the not knowing them as well like you know with my cousin or with my uncle I didn't know them as well or I hadn't seen them mm. either either or either ever or mm. in many years and so like that feeling of um, you know am I part of this grieving group became like even more pronounced and mm -hmm. that's when all the the feelings of other come up or of like I'm not in you know my dad's side of the family as like black which you know it's a little bit less a thing on my dad's side of the family because I have fewer cousins mm -hmm. and I you know there's less of that kind of um, like my cousins are also biracial and so all that and we've been a closer group on my mom's side of the family, you know, the pretty much all of my cousins are white, and so that feeling is like more pronounced. Me and my sister are sort of like, you know, sort of just with each other a lot of that, mm -hmm. especially as we got older, um, and the cousins we were, you know, closer with when we were younger, sort of fell away, kind of thing, and so it it was sort of like, especially for some of or for one of the funerals where she was not there. Um, that feeling like I think ballooned a bit and that was one of my bigger experiences with grief um, because with my cousin she was very young and it was a surprise and all of that so you know I had a lot of this very big feeling of grief and she was not there as that sort of like support system at the time and so I think the feelings got kind of bigger mm -hmm. and that was where a lot of that like my feelings of being sort of caught in the middle uh, come out in some of those poems um, or feeling sort of disconnected from the situation at hand. Mm -hmm. I think like that's why I use some of the devices I do of you know these sort of abstract or wandering metaphors kind of uh, to represent the feeling of like floating <laughs> in this situation like not being entirely tethered down mm -hmm. is sort of how I looked at, at some of those poems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a poem um, later in the book that speaks to, and it's not a funeral poem, it's a family reunion poem. But it, I, I just, was thinking of that poem. Um, if you could read, let's see, on page yeah. 52, Miss Memory of a Family Reunion Many yeah. Years From Now. What I like about this is like all that memory, the speaker is thinking, I ultimately write this story, it's ultimately mine. Yeah, so uh, can I talk about the poem a little bit? Please? Yes. Um, so with this poem, I was thinking about, you know, which I'd expressed in one of the earlier poems, the idea of the family being brought together through mm. grief and those sorts of ideas. And I was thinking about, you know, this family reunion in the future, us being brought together and how I don't feel entirely connected to that idea. Um, May God bless my people, my uncle, my aunt, my mother, my good father. Oh, remember them kindly in their time of trouble and in the hour of their taking away. James Agee, Death in the Family. Then the place I never was, all 11 of us rolled out onto the grass, passing flasks, pre-mixed wheelbarrow liquor burning steady into the dirt. Our fathers and mothers, aunts and uncles up the hill, my father lighting his cigar on embers from another's cigarette. The children, the babies, asleep already, their mothers are abstinent and tiring. Still, we play games aloud, only moving to send flasks down the line. We never have I ever, like teenagers, 
calling out memories, incomprehensible noise by the time it reaches our mother's ears. I say things I've never said, the things I mean. Not, we should do this more. Not, I miss you, but I don't feel like I know you, any of you. I don't know if I love you. And I meet their eyes when I say it. Family, that strange hill. Mismanaged weeds and patchy grass. But among it, it all, crocuses grow. Yes, even here. Mm. Their petals. Oh, sorry, I forgot there was a little bit more on the next oh. page. <laughs> My apologies. Their petals are closed for the night, but come morning, they surely open pearls in the autumn light. Mm. Mm. I love that one. Mm -hmm. I think we can all relate to it, too. Yes. Um, well, uh, so I, I, I think I want to ask you about monsters and maybe monsters and heroes. And um, I mean, because that, uh, of course, I was really struck by the, the Frankenstein poem because it's a book I teach and research and stuff. And it was a really powerful and interesting poem. But then there, there are also the two, um, the two like lost pregnancy poems that also had a lot to do with kind of images of monster-like beings. So I, I think I saw there, there was like each of your parents and you were all in strange relationships to these these monster beings <laughs> um, in really compelling ways. And then also I was as I was looking back and trying to figure out how to ask this question, I also came, stumbled back on Cancer Man, who seems to fit into that, mm -hmm. even though it's a superhero that you created, mm -hmm. seems like exists in the same sort of series of relationships. Um, I don't know, do you want to, did, did I give you enough to talk about something there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think that was an idea or a theme that I didn't realize was there until probably pretty late. Um, some of the poems in there were either revised or written pretty late on. The first one I actually wrote of that group was um, the Second Lost Pregnancy poem, which then became two poems. Um, with that, it kind of all spawned from one initial idea, which was I wanted to represent the scene that you were talking about earlier, the scene of you know, my sister comes up the stairs and she tells me that, you know, my mom is upset over my transition. She's downstairs and I just go down the stairs and I am watching her. And I think like that small moment was a very big moment of like grieving for me personally. It represented a lot like to me and how I felt about my transition and how my family, at least I felt, felt about my transition. You know, a lot of those things for me became a very big moment. So when I was beginning to work more on my thesis, I knew that that poem had to exist, mm -hmm. but it was very hard to get it to exist. Uh, it was not like an easy moment to write about, uh, and I couldn't really find the right vehicle for it. So that was where you know second lost pregnancy initially came from, and I think there was a lot of feelings of like being sort of in the dark, um, being sort of surrounded by shadows, there being very little light, because the scene to me is like just the kitchen light on, and I see her, and the, you know, the stairway is dark, I'm in darkness, all of that. And that was sort of what that scene looked like visually for me and like my memories. And for me, I think monsters, I think subconsciously I thought, or I think darkness, I subconsciously think monsters. Mm -hmm. And so I think like from that memory, mm -hmm. some of those monsters or that haunting emerged. Uh, this feeling of you know not being in the right body became the idea of the body snatcher and like other related lore and so those sort of ideas became interconnected in the way of you know, tracking the kind of nightmare that that scene existed for for me in my mind was like this moment is a nightmare and so it spawned its own kind of nightmares um, and then I think like Another poem that's sort of connected to that idea is the um, poem that I write from my sister's perspective. <clears throat> the poem of a, uh, you know, today your younger sibling cooks mm -hmm. dinner. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that, Which is right next to the Cancer Man poem. That yeah. scene of dinner. I think to me that that one is connected in a strange way um, because I also represent very briefly um, 
myself and my parents as monsters in that I um, at least in the original version it was a longer scene but uh, the idea of you know wanting us to look like monsters instead of humans um, so that there would be you know so that it would make sense so that everyone's behavior would line up I think for me there was like this feeling that there were moments of monstrousness in us there were moments where you know I behaved in a way that I didn't like and my parents behaved in ways that I don't think that they liked um, that became sort of this feeling of I don't know, a little cheesy but like the monster in us mm -hmm. right? yeah. the monster that is sort of represented in the things that we did and didn't say um, and that's also I think why the cancer man poem is is linked as well to me um, that is like a thing that wasn't said my dad didn't actually tell me that he had cancer it was I found out through my cousin my younger cousin was the one who was like oh you didn't know and I was like no nobody told me mm -hmm. um, so to me it was like a thing unsaid and a thing that was also lurking in the background as well to like my childhood in some ways um, so even though that character or that idea became like this hero it's it's sort of an absent hero an anti-hero a little bit as well um, pretty pretty frightening hero. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yeah we should hear those two poems back to back you know the, at 12, I created my first superhero, and then today, your younger siblings, because they are paired. Yeah. Can I get a page number on this? Page nine. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> uh, okay, the first one is At 12, I created my first superhero, Cancer Man. His skin corrodes nearby enemies, voice harsh and low. His eyes pierce foes into place, his bones pop and step. He wears all black armor, and with each hit, it grows swollen and grows and grows, consuming oxygen around him, propagating like a cloud. They called for Cancer Man with a cluster of cells under a microscope, projected to connect the stars. He rushed to save high rises engulfed by anarchists and stood at their bases, seeping cancer into the soil, the ground rotting out from under them, villains vaulting from windows, screaming Geronimo. And he had a family, often kidnapped or ransomed. He was at his best with them gone, foes torn asunder by the quick division of cells, bodies filled with rot and maleficence in his wake. But when his wife and children returned safe, he turned slow and sullen. He would lock himself in the basement, sawdust flying, grit covering the smell of blood. When they knocked at the door, and they did, he'd lock it, saying, I don't want you to get sick. Whew, what mm. an ending. Yeah, wasn't Judy talking about in Jacob's defense about how a poem has to, the ending of a poem has to either close the door or open it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like this almost does both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Endings like, of poems can also kick you in the solar plexus, which yeah. is what this <laughs> one does. It does, yeah. It's just, there's a finality to it, but it also, like, suggests that, like, things will go on, he will live on, you know. it's Both are happening at once for me. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Um, I want to... I want to... Um... Oh, we're going to read the next one. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. go ahead and read the next one. And then, then, sorry. We'll... then I'll ask a question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, let me get right into that. Today, your younger sibling makes dinner. The kitchen light, light reflects into the sea of your bowl, the face of the rising sun. Your forked gores arancini into its limelight. Watch how it brings that panko crust to glisten. In dance class, you practice the basics first position, second position, plie. Here, your toes stretch into point the way you'd watched. Your sketchers bend silently towards grout. <laughs> it would be delicious if only you could touch it, pan-fried chicken still sizzling in sauce, sending curds of lemon to scent the air. The tongs lean out of the full bowl and tune resonance against your mother's tallest face, and lavender sways its way down, cradled by tension. Your not-yet-brother digs a ragged nail into the web of his thumb. It breaks and blades past palm skin. Then your father moves, slow, slow as a rolling thunderstorm, to send his bowl clattering past your own. You won't remember the argument, just the rising of voices over cooling carbonara. Mm. 
Your mother's eyes find you only then, and you wonder if enduring means different things to the two of you, both quiet but just as angry. You know the not yet brother as other by how he yells back. You wish they all three looked like demons instead of people, bent their necks at unnatural angles, breathed fire. Instead, you watch your father's eyes hollow by the rim of his glasses, his exhales taste of his cancer. If it was just the two of you here, you and your father, wouldn't you ask for the difference between you, eldest daughter, and he, eldest son, the way the bloodline beats a responsibility like rhythm? Once your mother placed an infant into your arms and taught you suffering, you would take anything that child gave if it meant being the broad, warm chest to shield those brown eyes. Yet it's now when you walk past that second door, dark, slightly ajar, hear your name called, now, when your body makes room in the doorway and blocks the hall light, that child lowers a knife, hands curdled with blood, and asks for a washcloth. Whew, again. Mm. Snaps. Right to the solar plexus. Yeah. D do any of your poems terrify you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question you don't have to, like, Explore because <laughs> Raph was going to lead us on our next next journey. Oh, well, it's a good question though. Um, but my my question's a little more banal. I I think that I'm wondering. We we talked about in our last thesis meeting about the theme of the phoenix rising mm -hmm. from the ashes, resurrection, um, resurrection, exactly. And there's our first section in the collection is titled "Neither Phoenix Nor Sun." And then the final section, with just one poem, um, about the same title, it's called Do Over. Mm -hmm. um, and I am very curious about the theme of the Phoenix, um, and about resurrections, do overs, um, reemergences. And I was wondering how that theme, how that motif informs um, the way you write about transness. Um, and kind of what was going through your mind when you were when you were picking that out as a theme? Yeah, I think one thing that for me very early was in my mind was like these two mirrored ideas. Um, when people, they don't as much now, but a few years ago when people talk about transness, they would talk about like the parents being like, I lost my daughter yeah. or I lost my son, right. uh, which always majorly... Um, icked me out because it's like you didn't lose anything but like right. that was a lot of my anger um, I felt a lot of like resentment towards that very idea because I was like there was nothing lost you gained something right yeah. and like I'm not miserable so how did you lose anything mm -hmm. right um, and I was you know I've gotten a little bit it's gotten a little bit easier but it was still it still is a little bit and it um was very difficult for me to understand my parents' feelings, especially my mother's, of you know any sort of grief uh, over my transition, um, and you know I know that part of that was built from like not understanding it as well back then, um, but you know other parts of it I just don't think I could ever understand right. uh, because I just have you know an entirely different perspective to it, um, and so for me this idea of like remaking myself from the ground up mm -hmm. was very prevalent to me um you know i threw out most of my wardrobe <laughs> for a while i was wearing nothing but cargo shorts which a friend gave me because i had very little to wear um you know it just like i didn't feel comfortable in anything so what am i what do i have right I'm, and like that was sort of a, a visualization of what it meant to me to like rebuild like i had to rebuild right. my wardrobe like i was just being born i had to pick out a new name like everything was sort of like building you know a new person a bit for me and um, so I had that on the one side, sort of that anger about having to rebuild and feeling like in some ways I did it on my own. And then also that sort of structural support that for me is represented in things like the do-over mm -hmm. um, of like having some tools to manage some of those feelings of anger or resentment and having some ways to sort of refresh or restart and also knowing that, you know, my friends, my family, my extended family were there for me in the way that they could be, right? That they were also trying. And so I think for me, there's like that resentment playing out against the feeling of like they were trying and they were doing what they could. 
um, that is sort of like battling against each other constantly, um, which is why I think I chose a metaphor that's a bit more violent, like the phoenix, that is like yeah. burning and then being rebuilt from the ashes. Um, I chose that as a metaphor because it felt, you know, a bit more how I felt. It was not a peaceful <laughs> transition. Uh, it was not a peaceful rebirth, but it it did happen, and I came out stronger through it. And you know, it didn't exist on its own. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that was. That's also why I chose to put do over at the end because mm -hmm. I was debating very much about what was going to be the end poem and I went with do over not just because I wanted to complete that idea um, of rebirth but also because I wanted it to end on a positive note. <laughs> I, I realized towards the end that I wanted it to end in a place that was um, honoring the way that I felt overall which was sort of an extending, extending a hand a bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of opening the door, like you're saying, either open or close the door. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to end opening the door, which I think is why I, why I put do over at the end. This leads me into another question, actually, um, and I would like you to read both of these poems at some point. But why? Now that we know why you ended with do over, why did you open with tracing a name? I feel like it's the perfect prequel to what I'm going to get into. I feel mm -hmm. like it does at least a little bit of everything that I'm going to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it deals with my transition in a small way. It deals with my grief in a small way. It deals with my um, family, my relationship with my father in a big in a way. Big way. <laughs> <laughs> it deals with my sort of pressure around names and um, discovering my name. Uh, and discovering an identity is really what it represents more so than like a literal name mm -hmm. is, you know, discovering an identity for me both within families and on my own as a person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the second or the third section, actually both, kind of deal with me finding identity as I move into adulthood and as I move into these bigger experiences. And so, excuse me, so, you know, it was a bit of, like a bit of everything, mm -hmm. of finding identity is really what that first poem was mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Um, sort of finding yourself within a family unit, unit and coming to understand your parents as people, as like not just you know these paragons or whatnot, but as people who are flawed and have experiences that they're coming from. And so that's why I was like, well, there's really no other poem that could begin it than tracing a name because that's what it's all about for me. Could we hear Tracing a Name? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah hear definitely. Name? Yeah, okay. definitely. It's a longer one. I've got to <laughs> yeah. Take a sip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should actually. Tracing a Name. His name, just one piece of a father, Wisconsin in the fresh hours of summer, June 20th, 15 hours and 22 minutes of sunlight the day he was born, days already shortening by his sixth month, angles slipping into snow as he rocks himself into that budding landscape of frost and death, December crawling in, how fast the time goes. Had trouble tracing much further than that, names changed hands through stubbornness or necessity, but I'm trying to find out what was his to begin with what I'm owed as son. My last but first name decided long before my birth, long before any other part, before he sat with my mother. No nicknames, we're gonna call them the name we give them. Names pass through my grandmother, not grandfather. Name I spell out each time I say it so they get it right. Drop the E. Once my grandmother got the family crest made, printed, framed. I thought it looked ridiculous, clip art, paint bucket rate, <laughs> but I remember the text. Corda serrata pando, I open locked hearts. Wonder how to describe it, the tension we're born with, the rocket engine in our blood. I wasn't the first, though I felt like it, rabid and crouched in my cousin's room at 10, refused to hear him say, we all boil like this, until I heard it from my father, who never told me nothing. Nothing, no, not about anger, fathers, cancer. He told me count to ten, so I still do. 
try, picture this man swinging, or picture this man counting, breathing in a dimly lit pool hall, the hustle and shark, the five eight fast swinger they call in for backup. O oh, quiet genius, O oh, furious eclipse of childhood, O oh, colossus, man of the house, table, front seat. One and two and breathe slowly and methodically twice, then take breath in like you're ready for a blow. Three and sometimes you don't want to be a time bomb or his son. Four and five and shave the beard down to baby face, expose buried red hairs under all the black. Let it pile up in beautiful summer sinks and witness your ugly. Seven and sometimes your father was fast, so fast he set records, but you trail. You've always been trailing behind all sciatica game, mad cruiser with a cane. Eight, and splatter everything you remember about that self across the shower doors, explosion, gunshot. Beg for your own manhood, one you can get without hurting anyone. Nine, and sometimes you have nothing more than a broken bowl with a name you don't want to recognize, a name you've thrown away. 10. Dad, I don't like this method very much. I still want to hit something. Always arguing, he and I, when my transition began, I found new ways to shut him out. Started with the secrets I'd tell everyone else, trickled down to him through my mother's whispers. Then therapy, then my name, closing the door. I remember trying to come out. A month ago, you said you were bisexual. Now you're transgender. This dysphoria, wanting hormones, surgery, where are you getting this? Do you even know what you want? So I wanted to move forward without him, wanted nothing. Instead, his quiet fury. When I picked my name, I asked my sister, my mother, my best friend. We sat and eliminated names. I knew someone with that name in high school. It's a no. <laughs> Found new ones, crossed out more. I didn't say a word to him until it was decided, though I'm sure he heard. My mother, the bridge, the stopgap, bandage on a breaching dam. Years later, I took a long time to think of that name. Mm. You and your sister, each part of that name, you had to, needed to change it, but I didn't get to be a part of that process. And it meant something. It meant something to me. <clears throat> Theodore, Greek from Theos and Doron, gift of God. The Saint Theodore burned even Magna Mater then was lit aflame himself, dragon slayer, burning martyr. Ivory, English, gender neutral, ebony and ivory, white as in elephant tusks, as in pale, as in wise, prosperous, kings 1018. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. Kevin, Irish, composed of Cam and Jin, Cayman, dear birth, noble birth, you could have named me Juniper instead. St. Kevin's Feast Day, the 3rd of June, an ascetic, so calm a blackbird could nest her eggs in his palm, yet drowned a woman who tried to seduce him. Might have kept that name. June, Juniper, father in June, son only a month away, son only born of July. Brought into popularity a river name for a time. Kelvin, stem, stalk, rise up. Masculinity, Latin, a set of behaviors distinct from sex, cultural practice of status, prestige, dominance, a deep sea, and we black men are dense, dive heavy and sink, can't swim. Mom's the sentimental one, but I gave him a best dad pocket watch once. It's been decades, shitty brass, surely tarnished, clock long since stopped, but I wonder if he still has it. If it sits in his nightstand by the gun, glasses cloths, pocket knife, chargers and coasters, if he still pops it open from time to time, turns the crown, and watches the hands cleave through time. It's a beautiful poem, but it does set up all the themes that the reader is going to encounter, and that, that, that's such brilliance, uh, yeah. such genius. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask about is the theme of motion and movement that uh, some of the, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the Canada poem, that can you talk about how actual physical moving from place to place there, you know, 
I wouldn't say that you're a poet that in, invests a lot in place, like describing a place. Mm -hmm. Places feel more like states of mind, emotional and uh, psychological states of mind for the speaker. Like you've got, you know, the poem. With, and thinking about that, I'm like, you know, black Americans going to Canada to save themselves on the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. Like this poem is your version of that. So could you read that poem? Yeah. Um, and, and talk about, you know, what does transportation or movement mean for the speaker of these poems? Let's see, get a, get a page number on that. <coughs> What page is that? I have it pulled up, but I'm not sure the page. Oh, 27. Page 27. 27. So do you want me to read first or talk about the... Whichever way feels best to you. Sure, I'll talk first. Um, so I think for me, the reason why motion or movement keeps coming back up in the poem is partially the obvious of like transitory, you know, mm -hmm. moving through states and moving through time and those sorts of uh, aspects. Uh, and then also like the dreamlike aspects moving in and out of reality. But part of it I think is just like the sort of context of at least a good portion of my transition, especially early. Um, I lived in the same house in Stonewick until I was 15, until and I basically I finished my um, sophomore year of high school. Um, so from the time I was like two to the time I was you know, 15 or so, lived in the same house. And then we moved to Indiana. Um, yeah, I know. And <laughs> what did my face <laughs> just <you> do? <laughs> and then after that, um, you know, after that I went to college, so it wasn't as much linked. But after that, my parents were basically moving every one to three years, um, you know, pretty constantly, and basically like every time, you know, I'm meet up with a friend and they're like, where do your parents live now? Like, that's sort of the running joke. Um, and then I also was moving, you know, from schools and everything like mm. that. So went from very much having like a sense of home to like not really having one fairly quickly. Um, and then that's also at the same time that I'm going away to college. So it's like, I'm sort of feeling you know displaced a bit but there's also not really somewhere for me to go back to in the same way that you know Stonewick kind of was so I think like that's kind of why that's a backdrop constantly of movement mm -hmm. um, because like it's also in my mind a feeling you know like there is no sort of settled ground like there's no like permanent home um, that like exists as much anymore so the you know the poems keep moving as I keep moving mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure things out you know on the road a bit um, I have several driving poems just mm -hmm. a lot happens on the road uh, when mm -hmm. you're driving for 11 hours straight <laughs> so uh, a lot of those long drives and you know sort of how I felt about them are definitely a part of a part of the narrative mm -hmm. um, did a lot of thinking in those drives <laughs> so not a lot else you can do do you drive and write? Sometimes. Mm. I have, like, um, I'll, like, you know, run an idea through my head or whatever. Um, and then just, like, hit my recorder and mm -hmm. just throw out ideas mm -hmm. and then transcribe it later. So, yeah. Mm. Well, that's good. I just read something about Sam Shepard randomly today, and it said that he uh, wrote in the car on paper. Oh, no. Yeah. Was he being driven by somebody? <laughs> I did sound like it. Oh no! <laughs> so he put the paper on the steering wheel. Oh, oh no! Yeah, don't no, do that. No. Just oh, don't do that, Sam. That, that seems out. like a Sh Sam Shepard kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it does seem like it does seem on cowboy. brand for on brand for yeah. Sam yeah. Shepard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, just the just the voice Good. recorder. <laughs> yeah, just the voice Safe. recorder. Try to try to at least not have a you know notebook out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Please don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna road trip up to Canada. I'm going to road trip up to Canada and get the golden elixir they won't fill here. Going to sit on the Michigan border and pump my subcutaneous. Pop a vial like champagne, coat my hands in deep, heady smell. 
like expired sweat and burning tires, and hope my stratum corneum licks up a taste. I'm going to buy enough panacea, panacea to bathe in it, reap the whole supply with a scythe, leave nothing behind. Going to clear, uh, going to clear out the whole center console and jam its sticky stuck with needles and hormones. Don't envy me my first addiction. I wanted me to be. I wanted to be a man so bad it could kill. Dress shirts I begged pectoral, bought to grow into. I put away money for the origin of hysteria and ectomy. Eked a nine eighty-four day supply of mint manliness out to ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. I'm going to road trip up to Canada, and when they grant me five or maybe ten 10 milliliter bottles, I'm going to park close enough to thumb the blue water bridge and, full of golden testosterone, cry it a little bluer. It's, it's a really interesting poem to me because it has the themes of a blues song, like mm -hmm. this feeling of celebration and also this feeling of, of sorrow. Mm -hmm. And also, in the blues, there's so much about transportation, road tripping, you know. So I, I, I just love the uh, pop a vial like champagne, which is, I don't know if you were doing this on purpose, but it, that's an image I get from so many late 90s, early 2000s bad hip hop videos like you know <laughs> popping the champagne while you know naked women cavort around it's like so i love like taking that i i, I just sort of associate that image with something so uh, dastardly masculine and taking it and pulling it into this poem i just think that's amazing well my my dad he opens uh, champagne in the most boring way you know he puts like the towel over top and everything it's just like <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you got to like, like have it going up so. in the air. And... Well, and this is also kind of what you're saying, Allison, um, calls to mind this idea of like trans masculinity versus cis masculinity and how this kind of reappropriation of like the cis man's like machismo, you know, obviously trans men can have plenty of machismo themselves, of course, but like coming to the experience of masculinity vis-a-vis -vis transness lends one a kind of insight that a you know in into just like gender the gender spectrum that cis people cis men obviously don't have mm -hmm. you know um and so to take that to take that kind of like bad hip-hop video idea and put it into this you know getting test this journey to get testosterone Right, you know, um, that feels like a really inspired idea to me. Yeah, I mean, you. yeah, I really <laughs> like that. Do, do you know that uh, novel by Jordy Rosenberg, uh, Confessions of the Fox? Yeah, I've heard of it. Um, well, it's a, it's a set in 18th century London, and it's partly about like Marx's theory of the primitive accumulation, but it's also like there's kind of this like MacGuffin of testosterone, mm -hmm. like access to, like part of, it's a kind of a speculative fiction thing. And there's this, you know, technology of, of uh, hormones being available mm -hmm. in the 18th century, which isn't real, but it's like a major, it's sort of the, the secret thing behind the plot. and. This poem like really reminded me <laughs> of that, like just that idea of like you know going on this trip right. to get the the vial that you'll pop like champagne. It just has a real resonance. You might you probably enjoy that. So like <laughs> uh, I recommend it. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> well, we are just about at the hour mark. Um, I'm gonna ask you to. Do you have any other questions, comments for Eli before we yes. move on? Yeah, I do have one, and maybe Ralph can come in on this as well. This is a book. This right. needs to be published. Yes, um, and I know that you're thinking of you know, psychology and other, but I mean, if this existed as a book I know that there are people that I would give it to like read yeah. this uh, and I and I want it to be in conversation with other books 
on transness and on race and I can't do that unless you start, you know, <laughs> making your poems public and uh, because you're such an amazing writer, thinker, poet. So my last statement is, you know, just start getting this out there. Uh, be selective, of course, because there are people who would take this and not know how to handle it correctly. Right. Um, there are people who would be ideal. Um, but it, it needs to be in a form that's not just sitting in a library. <laughs> it, it, actually, things don't sit in libraries anymore. You know, you <laughs> pay, either. you pay, <laughs> you pay somebody, and, and they put it in a digital enclave. And yeah, <laughs> but you know, that's gatekeeping. You know, it's in this digital enclave, and the people who need to read it don't even know it exists. It, yeah. So rather than you know, question that's 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 like okay, now we have this amazing book. It needs to be. Have any of these poems been published individually? No. Oh my so, goodness. See, <laughs> like, I believe it was one of the workshops you had with me, and you asked for a list. And I'm like, okay, here are all the places, and then I didn't hear anything from you. I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push. I'm not gonna push. But yeah, there are there are places, there are individual magazines and also individual mm -hmm. presses who would like love to have yeah. this book on their list. Absolutely. I would really look at, and Allison, you would know better than I would, but I know there are queer presses, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like queer run presses um, that are putting out fantastic stuff. Um, um, oh, I just forgot his name. I'll think of it. The poet, he's a black queer poet. Um, he's like huge. I'm going to look him up. Give me a second. Okay. <laughs> well, I, 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 I share the enthusiasm, mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is really, go. really a great manuscript. So, thank you. Uh, do do get it out there. Okay, I've I've done filling time for you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Danette Smith. Oh yeah, the obvious name. Yeah, I completely forgot. Yeah. But Danette Smith, kind of figuring out where maybe where he's at. Mm -hmm. um, I know he's in St. Paul. I don't know if he publishes out of there. Oh well, he publishes at, publishes at Gray Wolf. So that might be, I know Grey Wolf is like, whoa, but yeah. like that would be just submit widely and include places like Grey Wolf mm -hmm. in your some mm -hmm. rounds of submissions, you know. You can just submit as a poet, right? And you could just submit. Well, it depends contests. on whether it's a press that does a contest or a press that has open submissions okay. or a press that, you know, reads year round. And I know all sorts of different presses that have different approaches, but I think yeah, the idea of a, of a queer press is really appealing for this book, but I think all sorts of people need to read it. Yes. Um, just, for, just for the sheer beauty of the language. That, that's one thing we ha I don't think we've praised you enough, that um, the language in here could be, you know, just sort of dutiful and just report what happens, but, you know, at every opportunity for you to amp up what's poetic, you do. And then you sort of slide in some really fun in jokes that anyone who <laughs> like actually knows you would get. <laughs> so uh, that I also appreciate it. But yes, this needs to exist out there in the yes. marketplace as a book, and then it, it will win awards. Yes, I agree. And people will write to you and say, "I'm so glad you wrote this book." This, I mean, that um, it really feels like a book, like that. Yeah. The the way these themes are threaded throughout. And like, I don't think there's any kind of thematic moment, intended or not, like the monsters, that doesn't, you know, kind of a reappear mm -hmm. and, and kind of gain from reappearing. I um, mean, there, there's a lot of connection between poems that aren't obvious anyway. Like, I, I thought, I, I love the poem Dining Room in Stonewick Trans Man Retrospective, which we haven't talked about. But it pairs really well with like any other poem that's also about your dad, like, like or could be construed that way. Like the the Frankenstein poem actually makes a really interesting pair with that, mm -hmm. um, partly because the views of your dad are radically different, I think, <laughs> <laughs> but in a, a really compelling and resonant way. Um, yeah. So, yeah. thanks for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, yeah, it's really I would exciting for me. I would I would really like to see this 
like formatted for Dr. Nutsley so we can submit it for the Outstanding Thesis Award. Um, if you could, so that's something we could work on talking yeah. to Dr. Nutsley about it. But I think that this this one I would definitely like to submit um, to submit for that for this coming year. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also, did we mention the sibling rivalry press? Sibling, I thought good? of sibling rivalry. Yeah. Um, they're not reading right now, oh, but as okay. soon as I think they're just having a little hiatus. As soon as that would be, uh, that's um, uh, Brian Borland's press out of Little Rock, um, and they did they did a chapbook for me uh, called Corporal Muse, which is one of my favorite little chapbooks. Um, but they do beautiful books. Um, yeah. Their, yeah, I checked their website the other day. It's like, we're, we're not reading right now. But I'm sure they'll be back to reading. Um, another press I thought of um, that does have a contest, but I think I, I think you do very well in their contest is uh, Diode Editions. Uh -huh. um, so Diode is, is not necessarily um, a queer press, but it's a press that they've handled so many books by queer people very well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I'm familiar with you that. can have presses that are explicitly say, you know, we're publishing queer people um, that sometimes are just as dangerous to you as a, a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can have press that aren't explicitly queer that are you know, very good. So, mm -hmm. you know, just keep in touch and we'll nag you. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so how are you feeling about publishing? Are you feeling a little shy? A little, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was sort of one of those things where I was like, oh, I should work on this, but then I just got back to working on my thesis or something like that, and I haven't really mm -hmm. you know, devoted as much attention to Well, since to you're going to have this gap year, you know, you're going to have this year where you're working, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, just one of the strategies is to set aside like a certain amount of time a week to do some research and find some places to send individual poems. Mm -hmm. um, amassing, say, a group of 10 poems that are in print, and you start thinking, well, maybe I, if I'm not ready for the full length book yet, maybe a chapbook. Concentrating on poems that are from this manuscript, but maybe taking a slice. And then having different versions of this manuscript. That's also another a strategy that people use. But yes, it, it needs to be out in, in the world. Yeah, I think we all agree on that heartily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. It's beautiful. Indeed. Yeah, it really is. Well, I think Eli deserves an MFA. I don't know what you all think. Take this MFA and run with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Take it. Demonstrated mastery of fine art, I'd say. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. 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 Do you have any questions for us as your committee? Um, I don't think so, no. So if it would be okay, I would still like to read Duo. Though. Yes, oh, thank yes. you for reminding me. Oh. <laughs> yes, awesome. I didn't want to end without that, and I completely forgot. <laughs> Typical me. You're not good at the two. two no, times. I'm not good at I can't <laughs> sandwich it. <laughs> Do over. Anger issues run in our family, so I count to ten. These days, it's how I portion out my night, my breath, my gin. Mm. One, two, three, ten. I wonder why I need this. Maybe my ego, towering alien threat, stretches up to the Chicago sky. My father and I are too much alike, made rational by my mother, her and her do-overs, held my hand in that ruptured twilight zone and its quiet breaths. Dad found it ridiculous how I calmed down from something so simple, a restart that you count. But he would get it if he thought about her distracting him with a hand on his, his tense fist going flat as she laughs. I exhale, dad, do it over, try again. Mm. 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 
Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. I appreciate you all for being here. Yeah. I was honored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And everybody watching, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you to our audience. Yeah. And thank you to our technical support. <laughs> 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 All right.